Hello, and welcome to another Center for Populist Urban Politics podcast. Try to say that five times really fast. I am your host, Kevin Lynn, and today I'm going to be joined by author and blogger John Michael Greer, and we're going to be discussing his latest book, The King in Orange, The Magical and Occult Roots of Political Power. Uh, for those who may not be acquainted with John Michael Greer, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Uh, John, he's a widely read author, blogger, and astrologer whose work focuses on the overlap between ecology, spirituality, and the future of industrial society. He served 12 years as the Grand Arch Druid of the Ancient Order of Druids in America, and he remains in that order as well as several other branches of Druid nature spirituality. He currently lives in East Providence, Rhode Island, with his wife, Sarah. John, it's great to be seeing you again, and welcome to the show. Or should I say, we're not, I'm not really seeing you, uh, we're talking to each other, because, John, it's not that you're technologically impaired, it's just that you've made some choices about what technologies you've chosen to bring into to your life. So you're talking to me today from a landline. I'm on a line of line. Um, the sound quality is better than um, it usually is on Skype or things like that. And you know, it's one of those things. Yeah, it, it is one of the most unthinkable things nowadays that individuals should have the right to choose what technologies they use. And because it's unthinkable, of course, I make a beeline for it. <laughs> right. And I think we're, you know, we're, we, we're going to actually kind of touch on that in se oh, yeah. probably in several areas throughout the interview today. Uh, well, John, I got to say, uh, your book is amazing. It, it, for me, I have, you know, all kinds of annotations in it. I have actually been memeing you. I've quoted you in, on several memes that I've launched out huh. into the uh, technosphere. And uh, I, I was just blown away to me because to me, I was trying to get my head around the 2016 2000, and, the, and the 2020 elections and mm -hmm. trying to understand well not so much understand because i believe in my mind i i got what was going on i sensed where things were going mm -hmm. uh but what i couldn't do was appropriately articulate it to myself mm -hmm. and others and mm -hmm. when i read your book it was like oh my gosh this is it this is the key that unlocks the door that allows me now to under you know be able to articulate mm -hmm. what happened and yeah i think uh to me uh, you, the great thing about the book is you kind of grounded it. We, you allowed us to understand what fueled Trump in terms of opinions and uh, what, uh, what was out there in, in the public consciousness at the mm -hmm. time, but also what Trump and his campaign did and what they were able to take advantage of and how they mm -hmm. were able to be uh, very quick on their feet and to me, it's amazing. When you look at 2016, that primary, and I always go back to January of 2016, John, mm -hmm. you were, you called that election for Donald Trump. And what That's you correct. said was he, and you said he is the, whether he believes it or not himself, he is mm -hmm. the only one speaking to class warfare. And, mm -hmm. you know, personally, my foray into politics came in the early 90s. I worked on, you know, as a volunteer on the Ross Perot campaign, mm -hmm. which I consider him like one of the first America firsters. And mm -hmm. then later on, I worked for him for two years after that. And, mm -hmm. um, and really what he was talking about was, look, if we engage and continue down this globalist path, path this will lead to class warfare and mm -hmm. there will be winners and losers and the winners will be the owners and the losers will be the workers. And that brings me to the first thing I'd like to talk to you, John, because for you, what you inform the reader of is they have to understand a concept and that concept is class warfare. And you said, and I'll quote you here from your book. You go, where do they, where, okay, <clears throat> let me go back a little bit here. 
It also happens that you can determine a huge amount about the economic and social prospects of people in America today by asking one remarkably simple question. And that is, where do they get most of their income? Broadly speaking, there are exceptions to which I'll get to in a moment. It's from one of four sources, returns on investment, a monthly salary with benefits, an hourly wage without benefits, or a government welfare check. So essentially, you're either a member of the investment class, the salary class, the wage class, and or the uh, welfare class. Now, mm -hmm. of course, you talk about entrepreneurs are in there, they're another, but really, these are the big classes. And why uh, that so that was amazing to me, John, because this is what fueled Trump. This is what fueled Perot. Exactly. exactly. Now, this is, this is also something that you're not supposed to talk about in today's America. The fact is that we do have a very heavily class-ridden system. The boundaries between the classes aren't absolute. There's a certain amount of, of slippage one way or the other, people rising or falling across these barriers. But the barriers are real. And there has been a huge attempt to erase that fact and to, and to not, allow, not, not make any room for people to talk about the fact that, A, these classes exist, and B, your prospects in life and your economic history for the last half century have been largely determined by which of these classes you're in. Um, the, the salary class, we could also call them broadly the managerial and professional class, has mm -hmm. done very well during that last 50 years. Right. Um, They've yeah, done they've done really well. They, they've done they've done fine. What nobody wants to talk about, and this is the most explosive political fact of our time, as well as the most unmentionable, is that during that same time, the working class, the wage class, has been destroyed. Fifty years can ago. Can I can I quote you from your book here, John? Yeah, I can say you you can quote me, or I can probably quote myself. Okay. <laughs> Go But ahead. You said, and I'll quote: "The unspeakable truth that shaped the discourse of pre-Trump era was that the good people." the morally virtuous people enthusiastically supported policies that plunged tens of millions of Americans into poverty and misery. It's, it's crucial to realize how important and how real that is. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, a family of four with one working class income, one wage class income, could afford a home, a car, three square meals a day, medical care, the whole nine yards. They could afford an ordinary lifestyle. Nowadays, a family of four with one working class income is probably living on the street. It's that bad. That's a huge transformation, and nobody wants to talk about it. The other, the thing, the other thing, one of the other things that I, one of the other points that I raise in the book is that this did not happen by accident. It did not happen by an act of God or a force of nature. It happened because the United States government systematically pursued certain economic policies that drove wages through the floor while maintaining salaries very high. Unrestricted illegal immigration, which drove down wages, uh, unrestricted offshoring of. Um, Of, of many work, working class, many wage class jobs, which, you know, again, if there are fewer jobs and more people competing for them, that's going to drive down wages. And finally, metastatic government um, regulation of everything, which benefits large business at the expense of small businesses. Small businesses are much more efficient at producing jobs than, than the big corporations are. So once again, you squeeze out sources of job creation while maximizing the number of people competing for those wage class jobs by, you know, throwing open the doors to To illegal immigration, not legal. Legal immigration is fine. Legal immigrants have civil rights they can enforce. Illegal immigrants don't. Right, so you they're... have well, you have it's... this you have this mm -hmm. huge bottom class of people who are, who can be made to work at sweatshop wages. If they give you any trouble, you drop a dime to La migrants and you know send them elsewhere. And and so that was you. That has been used to destroy the wages of the working class and thus um, the lives and the economic hopes of um, thousands of American communities and tens of millions of Americans. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, that was brilliant. In fact, when I lecture, I, I quote that portion of your book a lot. Um, okay, good. Because it's really important for, because a, a lot of my work uh, is in the area of immigration. I'm mm -hmm. uh, more of a restrictionist there. But mm -hmm. if you don't understand the cult of neoliberalism that got us here, that is essentially the unrestricted, unrestrained movement of capital and people across 
international borders so as uh -huh. to maximize profit if you don't understand uh -huh. that's that's the game you're playing in uh, -huh. uh you're you've you're you're on you've only got one leg of the three-legged stool i think <laughs> and so you land on your rump exactly right. and the thing is this this line has been in circulation since the time of david ricardo back in yes. the 18th century the invention of free trade theory which was great for English capitalists. It was great for the very well-to-do in England. It destroyed the English working class. Mm. That's, if you read Charles Dickens and you know, these scenes yes. set in these horrific slums, those slums were created by free trade policy because it was so much, so much more economic for the British, British capitalists to offshore jobs to places like India. Mm -hmm. and, leave the, and, and, you know, and leave the English working class to starve in gutters. And they did it. That's the same logic that went that was driving um, the offshoring craze of the last half of the 20th century here in the United States. Um, you know, let's more profits for the for the for the managerial class, more profits for the salary class, lots of benefits, everything's fine, and the working class scar starves in a ditch. And they were fine with that. It, now, one one thing you brought up, and I want I wanted to cycle back, uh, talking about the good people, the morally virtuous people. That's the that's one of the things that, you, that lets you know that you're dealing with an aristocracy. Mm. Our salary class is an aristocracy, and one of the things you one of the classic things about an aristocracy is that it always sees itself as the good people. The, the, I mean, think of, think of the words, an example for my book, the words noble and gentle. We, have, we think of all the connotations those have. Both of those words originally meant belonging to the upper class. That's all they meant. And so anytime you have an aristocracy, anytime you have a class of people who think they, you know, God or um, natural selection or the almighty market has destined them to run things and destined everyone else to starve, um, of course they convince themselves that they're morally superior to everyone else. And you know, that's, of course, a lot of what's going on in today's, um, in American society today. Well, the representatives of, this, of the salary classes preen themselves on their moral goodness. I have to quote one more passage on this from your book. You're right. Go ahead. Here is so often blaming the victims is much easier than talking about who's actually responsible for the current state of affairs, mm -hmm. who benefits from it, and what the real issues are. Of when course. that conversation is one that people have a privileged role in shaping public discourse desperately don't want to have. Mm -hmm. Blaming the victim is also an effective diversionary tactic, and accordingly, it gets plenty of use in the media these days. Oh, of course. We always have to talk. You, you'll notice, actually, and one of my readers pointed, pointed this out to me, the whole business with race, everything's got to be racism, everything's got to be race this and race that, that happened, that emerged in the American intellectual scene right after Occupy Wall Street rose and fell. Mm. All of a sudden, you had Occupy Wall Street, you had people talking about class issues. Right, and talking about the financialization of the exactly. economy. Exactly. Talking about the lack of, well, it's interesting. I, mm -hmm. What I loved about, you know, someone in Trump's campaign, you never really heard the term opportunity, but you heard it during the, in the Obama campaign, you heard it in the Clinton campaign. They talk about, mm -hmm. ooh, op, it's out there for you. Like, hey, if you just learn, <laughs> you will earn. But... <laughs> The reality is they, they've taken those, out, that, that, those chances to be part of the middle class away from so many of, of us. Of course. The, 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 thing is, the thing to keep in mind is the whole, you know, you've got to, earn, you've got to learn, then you've got, you'll earn. It's not true. As millions of Americans found out, they went to college to get degrees, as they were recommended to do by the media, by the politicians, and then they found there were no jobs. And they were mm -hmm. sacked with twenty, fifty, seventy thousand dollars in student loan, which they could not discharge by bankruptcy. Now, this was a disaster for the people who did it, but it was great for the universities. They oh, had all the universities this money. are racking up in money exactly. like you wouldn't believe. What we what we might as well call the academic industry um, is yeah, <laughs> it's it's a, it's another salary class thing because the bankers who were making the loans, the university personnel who were providing a facsimile of an education to the poor sods who fell for this shit. Right. Okay. It was it, they were all salary class, and so it really benefited them hugely. The, but the thing, the, but the thing to keep in mind is that the whole thing, um, it was a scam. 
And if you look at every one of the projects being um, splashed about by the salary class and their pet media and their pet politicians as we've got to do this you know, for the children, for the future. No, it's for their pocketbooks. Who mm-hmm. is making money off this? Look at that. Look, you know, laser beam intensity, focus on who makes money from this. We're, we, we're going to solve the problem of poverty by creating this huge welfare state. Well, the people on welfare suffer. Okay, they get they get no, they get next to nothing, and they have to constantly jump through the hoops of an intrusive government bureaucracy. But there are hundreds of thousands of bureaucrats with six-figure salaries and full benefit packages who are being hired to do this, and they're doing really nicely. Yeah, and they retire with benefits. exactly, and they retire with these exactly. It's who is making money off this is the first question to ask anytime you hear somebody pushing some kind of some kind of proposal, some kind of policy of the old Latin thing, qui bene, to whom do mm-hmm. the benefits go? If you keep that in mind, American politics in the early 21st century becomes as transparent as glass. And you know exactly who's pocketing what. It's interesting. I, I read a book recently by uh, Michael Sandel. It's called The Tyranny mm-hmm. of Merit. And in it, he basically says, you know, what they said, essentially what they did was said, okay, those jobs, we don't really need you because we're offshoring all these jobs, but go ahead and learn to code. Oh, wait a minute. All those jobs, we're outsourcing to, we're using these non-immigrant work mm-hmm. visa programs like H-1B, L-1, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and we're going to mm-hmm. bring in all these people that have been displacing tech workers at places like Disney, Northeast Utilities, SoCal Edison, Abbott Labs, mm-hmm. literally hundreds, you know, all for the sake of efficiency and maximizing profit, no. but... All for ahead. the sake of maximizing power, mm. because keep in mind, the people who actually cut the code know where they know you know where the digital equivalent of the bodies are buried they know how things work Absolutely. and so if you have people who are cutting code who are american citizens who have the you know the various rights that american citizens have you might one of these days be running into some serious problems especially if you are playing fast and loose with this or that if you're bringing them in from from a third world country somewhere and if well, they uh, uh, let me one, give you a great start. Just they, for no, a second. Just if they give, mm-hmm. let me finish. If they give, and if they give you a squeak of complaint, or if they do anything you don't want, you can send them home overnight. You have them under your thumb. You have power over them. And so the whole thing rotates again around who's making money, who's exercising power. Go on. Absolutely, John, and I can validate everything you just said because oh, yeah. with the H one B visa program, we bring in. Uh, total when you include the nonprofits and the government and everything about 120,000 people on it. Mm -hmm. Now, over 70% of those come from one country, India. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that Trump had done was it's a rule, he he made the change, but it didn't last through this next administration. Mm -hmm. Of course not. Raise that prevailing wage. So, Mm -hmm. but what we had found was the H-1Bs didn't care about that because what they want to do is get here because the H-1B visa is a dual intent visa. It's not just a work visa. So Mm -hmm. if they do their three years and then they extend for three years, that's six years and their employer decides to say, okay, we're going to let you apply for a green card. We're going to sponsor you for a green card. Well, the backlog because of the country quotas for an Indian who, say, someone who, from India whose employer sponsors them for a green card, they could be in that queue for 10 years. Mm-hmm. So, like you're saying, this employer has power over them for exactly. 16 years. And exactly. The dual benefit of there's no tech transfer going on because, you know, these aren't Americans that might go out and build their own business. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a great idea. Using sneaker net, taking their ideas and, mm-hmm. you know, creating new companies or going to work for someone else. Oh, mm-hmm. no, these are captive. They're literally, John, on the plantation and corporate America couldn't be happier. And, oh, of you course. know, that just mm-hmm. I, it absolutely validates mm-hmm. in my mind mm-hmm. what you just said. It's, it's, exactly it's, it's, it. the, it's the base. It's the basic gimmick. It's all about money and power. And it's not for the benefit of the people who are supposedly benefiting from it. Um, I mean, just to, to point to an obvious example, how many 
years now, how many decades now have we had all of these programs that were supposed to, on paper, benefit the African-American community? How much have they benefited? Not even a little bit. I say, did only over squat. And it's not because they're not smart. It's not because they're not perfectly capable of taking advantage of opportunities that are presented to them. It's because the opportunities are fake. It's because the whole point is to keep African Americans on the Democratic plantation, on the inner city plantation, on the local and state government plantation, voting the way they're told, doing what they're told, maintaining the status quo, and continuing in grinding poverty and misery because that way um, the defenders of the status, the status quo has nothing to fear from them as long as they can be kept dependent on the welfare check and on all the other little little or not so little things that are meant to hold, that are that were sold as ways of helping them and function as ways of holding them down and the only people doing good work to fight that and counter it are is you know like folks over at breaking brown and the american descendants of slaves movement where they're mm-hmm. saying look knock it off it's not about race it's about lineage and we realize what's going on with the Democratic Party, and we're mm-hmm. walking away from you because we know what the grift is here. Yeah. And that's, uh, but boy, people that try to fight this, John, mm-hmm. uh, literally, MSNBC will call them Russian bots. Oh, of course. <laughs> Of course. The thing is, Russia is the R- Russia is the all-purpose boogeyman at this point, for one very simple reason. Um, nobody in the in in the well-to-do classes in this country or Europe has yet forgiven the Russians for kicking our pet plutocrats out. You know, we put yellow. Oh, Yeltsin you're, you're came, talking about after the fall of the Soviet Union when yeah, those NGOs. Yeah, the Soviet Union went and, down. Yeltsin Yeltsin came in. All kinds of American and European businessmen flooded into the system, um, you know, arranged for the sell-off of, of government assets at fire sale prices to various plutocrats. It was a lovely little arrangement meant to reduce Russia to the status of an impoverished colony, and it didn't work because enough of the Russian enough Russians figured out what was going on, and Vladimir Putin figured out what was going on, and they turned the tables on. The, on the plutocrats, they turned the tables on the West, and Putin has, n- they, they have never forgiven Putin for that, they have, and they never will. So Russia is the bad country. Russia is, the, you know, Boris Badenov and Natasha <laughs> are everywhere, everywhere. You get moose, I get squirrel. I mean, they, these people's imaginations, partly you can tell that, it's a, that the baby boomers have held on to power too long, because they're still stuck sitting there in front of the black and white yes. TV watching Rocky and Bullwinkle and seeing Boris, you know, it's still circling in their minds. It's like all of these, uh, all of these Hollywood rehashes of 1960s comic books. Absolutely. Okay. And they... Absolutely. And so, they're, yeah, they're, so they're stuck. They're, they're looking for Boris Badenov. And, <laughs> but, but it's all, but they're also incensed at Vladimir Putin because the whole, if, if they could have, basically gotten Russia solidly under their boot and then broken it up probably into several different countries. Um, there, there would have been enormous wealth from that source as they, as they robbed it to the bare walls, as has happened to so many other nations that they've gotten their claws into. And that didn't happen. And now Russia is resurgent. Now Russia and China are on very good terms. Now Russia and Iran are on tolerably good terms. Uh, you know, and all of a sudden, the, the unilateral moment has cracked down through the middle, and things are not looking especially good for the Pax Americana. And yeah, so of course they're going to find... It's Russians everywhere. They've got to find Boris Badenov, because if they can't find Boris Badenov, if it's not a Russian bot, if it's not you know people who are um, evil racists just because they're evil racists, and the reason they're talking about the poverty of the working class is they're evil racists, we must recite these things over and over again because otherwise people will realize that it's them. That is bad policies pursued by selfish politicians, by greedy and corrupt, corrupt politicians, and the interests that backed them. Yep. And those now, are far too easily identifiable for their comfort. Go on. Hmm. Well, now that we kind of laid out why, you know, what this this winter of discontent is that gave mm-hmm. rise to uh, Trump's 2016 campaign. Let's get into the really fun part and let's talk about the magic. Uh, because he states, uh, 
The necessity for this dimension of magic rises in proportion to the gap between an aristocracy's self-image and consequences of its rule. Mm -hmm. A system of doublethink discussed earlier in this book, which demanded support for policies that devastated America's working class, but forbade any mention of the consequences of those policies mm -hmm. is a classic example of that process at work. So okay. how did yeah. this, how did it, how did it happen? How did, how okay. did Let's, let's take a step back first and make sure our listeners know what, what we're talking about here. Because people think magic, they think of Harry Potter. They think of, you know, the boy wizard waving a wand and going, ungrammaticus latinus, and having, you know, you know, Hollywood special effects. That is not magic. Harry Potter has about as much to do with magic as young Frankenstein has to do with real <laughs> science, okay? Um, magic is the art and science of, of causing change in consciousness in accordance with will. I'm going to repeat that because it's important. Magic is the art and science of causing change in consciousness in accordance with will. That definition was come up with by Dion Fortune, who was one of the, 20, one of the best 20th century magicians, uh, both hmm. theoretician and practitioner. As she, was, you know, she knew what she was talking about. And um, so that's the definition that I'm using here. It, the it, but but could it also to the layman out there, is it in a way marketing? Marketing is... Marketing is a sort of cheap secondhand magic. Let me explain that. Okay, uh, let's take let's take a classic example of a powerful magic spell. The one that I like to use is the billboards and other things like that that are trying to talk you into drinking fizzy brown sugar water. They call it right. cola. Okay, it's fizzy brown sugar water. Okay, that's all it is. And so, what do you see? What do you see when you when you look at the billboard? You do not see somebody trying to tell you this stuff is really good, or here are the reasons why you should drink fizzy brown sugar water. No, no. What you've got for it typically is say a clutch of people who they're young, they're handsome or beautiful, they're dressed in a kind of upper middle class uh, ca Friday casual fashion, they're grinning from ear to ear, they're obviously having a great time, and they've all got a can of fizzy brown sugar water clutched in a death grip or, or um, you know, sit, or sitting on the, on, the, on the table in front of them. Notice what's going on here. In terms of your conscious mind, you look at that and you say, oh, here are some actors, you know, waving around fizzy brown sugar water. But what your subconscious sees is, here are some people I want, I want to be like. They're young, Inspirational. they're handsome or beautiful, they're obvi they obviously have money, they're having a great time, they have nice social connections, because you never see people alone in these ads. And, you know, they're, they're, having, they're, just, they're having a great time. I want to be like that, and if I drink fizzy brown sugar water, I will be more like them. It's not logical. It doesn't have to be. That's the spell that's being cast at you to make you to make you subconsciously more likely to pick up the fizzy brown sugar water when you go to the store. Now, it is not good magic. This is evil magic because that fizzy brown sugar water is not going to do anything for you but rot your teeth. They are trying to twist your mind. They're trying to lie to you and make you believe a lie that drinking fizzy brown sugar water will make you look will make you more like those actors. And so that's, that's one kind of spell. Now, it is a very blunt instrument because, again, they're trying to apply that to everybody. They can't, aim it, they can't aim it at a person. They can't aim it even at a small group. They have to aim it en masse. And this is, is, it, one is the, it, a, it could also be called propaganda? I mean, yeah, that's because I'm thinking of Bernays' yeah, book from exactly. the 20s, Propaganda. Yeah. Exactly. It's exactly the same thing. Propaganda is marketing, is advertising, is cheap, debased magic. Mm -hmm. There are ways of causing change in consciousness with accord in accordance with will. And specifically, it's meant to debate, to lower your consciousness, to make you less conscious, to make you think less and react more. That's mm -hmm. what it's there for. So what happened in 2016 is that um, a group of people who were, who were assuming that was, what they were, that was how things worked, um, who, were, who had the job of trying to convince American voters to shut up and vote for Hillary Clinton, even though they, <laughs> even though they no, seriously, they, they had to have known that most Americans disliked and despised Hillary Clinton. They did not trust her. They, you know, they were convinced that she, they, they were perfectly aware that the only reason she was in a position to run for president is that she was somebody's wife. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, and, and she and wasn't so, likable. I'll tell you, she was likable. 
I'll tell you a great anecdote. Uh, an uh, anecdote. Uh, anecdote. Yeah. Anecdote. Uh, so when she was a senator, it was her birthday. Uh, she was living in a town. They were living in a, a townhouse in New York, and uh, it was funny because the way it was described to me was they had to put Bill way back in the kitchen, and she was up front where people when people came in because the charisma of Bill just overshadowed her, and they mm -hmm. would just would just naturally be drawn to him. So. Of course. Well, the thing is, Bill Clinton. Whatever else you say about him, he's a likable guy. Um, I'm sure Hillary has many virtues, but she is not likable. She's not charismatic, and she also had really even you know, no particular qualifications to be the the um, president of the United States. Um, the most of the people that I spoke to during the election, they were terrified that she was going to get us into war with Russia because of her 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 hard neoconservative views on on foreign policy. Um, they knew perfectly well that um, no matter what, you know, she might make some noise about how women ought to vote for her. She wasn't going to do anything for American women. It, I mean, when, when you, you, do you remember back when she first ran in 2008? Mm -hmm. And she got up there to, um, to make her, her initial speech at the beginning of her run to set the tone for her campaign. And the first words out of her lips were, I am so ready to lead. <laughs> It was all about her. Again, and, and the thing is, her slogan, both said, I, it was, I'm with her, not she's with me. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. It was, it, was, it was never that she thought she had to offer the American people anything. It was their job to fall in line behind her and, and, and escort her cheering to her coronation. Contrast and, that to Ross Perot. I'm yeah. Ross and you're the boss. Yeah. <laughs> But the thing is, her attitude pervades the salary class today. Yes, they're, they're, they're holding, it's, it's the same problem. You're seeing it in Britain right now, where labor is getting hammered because Keir Starmer and, and the, the labor leadership generally, their attitude is not, we should listen to the voters and find out what they want. It's, we need to tell the voters what they're going to vote for. And so... Constituencies that have voted Labour since the 1970s are suddenly voting conser voting Tory. They're voting Conservative mm -hmm. because the Tories will listen to them and the Labourites won't. <laughs> and but the the situation was the same with Hillary. She thought she could use marketing. She could use the the generic magic of our time, the debased magic of marketing and propaganda, to get people to vote for her. And she found out the hard way, um, and probably at the cost of a lot of damaged furniture, that they were not willing to do that. Wouldn't you want to be a fly on the wall when it was announced, told, when she oh. was informed that she had lost? Oh, no, I would not want to be. There, <laughs> there, has, there has been a rumor since about a year after the 2016 election that some, somebody videoed it. And the reason she didn't run in 2020 is that somebody videoed it, and she was quietly informed that if she uh, tried to get it, tried to run again, that was going to go public. I have no idea if that's more than a rumor, but that was the rumor. Apparently, yeah, a lot of furniture bit the dust. <laughs> well, that's a, you know, um, everybody has their way of dealing with stress. Everyone has their way of dealing with you know dealing with extreme disappointment, and she's got to have had. It's got to have been a very miserable time because she's not really the kind of person who can, who can listen, who can pay attention, who can be pay attention to, to the needs of others, who can really. She she's very focused on herself, and that's that's one kind of one kind of human being, but it's not really good if you're if you're a politician, and to have convinced herself that she was heading into the White House, until finally, the voters said no. That's got to have been crushing. That really has got to have been a ghastly experience for her. Yeah. Um, so, John, what are the tactics then of moving a, a, someone's conscious, consciousness to a will? How, how does okay. that manifest? How do, you, how do you work with this? Okay, the first, the first question, are you trying to manipulate them or are you trying to teach them to, to, to act by themselves? Because that takes two completely different approaches. Let's if go you're with gonna the... Because go, go would you say with, with the Trump voter, they were taught to act for themselves, correct? That was, that was exactly the trick. Because what we saw as people got going in, 
in the chans as people as some of these these alt right you know the alt right um, basement dwelling brigade um, piled into certain simple kinds of magical practice. Their whole point was to shake things loose, mm -hmm. was to disrupt the trance that marketing propaganda, that kind of magic is supposed to make. You, because, you just reminded me, there's that yeah. wonderful quote from Lao Tzu in the mm -hmm. Tao Te Ching where he goes, yeah. men are easily enchanted and that enchantment lasts a long time. Yeah, he, he was right. But basically, um, the difference between magic that is, that, that's intended to control people and magic that's intended to teach them to control themselves Magic that's intended to control people works by lowering the threshold of consciousness. It's to make you less conscious, to mm. make you think less and react more. So you're just, you just end up, you know, somebody gets on a television and says, oh, racist, and you just go bad or, or whatever, you know. Yeah, like you're, you, had, you, I got, I think the term for me, you called them snarl words. Yeah, snarl. Yeah, exactly. You tried out the snarl world. I got that from S.I. Hayakawa. Um, from his writing on, on general semantics. He mm -hmm. has some very good things to say about that. Um, yeah, basically, you trot out the snarl words, or you trot out the, 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 the warm, fuzzy words. Democracy. And everyone just goes, ah, but they don't think about what you're saying. That's the goal of the evil magic we're talking about here. Mm. The magic of liberation is designed to raise your level of consciousness and make you think, mm. to make you stop and say, you know, when you say racist, what exactly do you mean by that? When you say democracy, how does this qualify? When you say that's a lie, how do I know that you're telling the truth? And people like that are dangerous. People mm. like that are an extreme danger for, for, an inst for, for an entrenched aristocracy like the one that runs America today because they won't just do what they're told. And they won't just react in predictable ways if they decide not to do what they're told. They can come up with their own options. They can basically look at the situation and say, you know, I'm going to do something different with my life. Mm. We actually have something going on like that right now, and it's causing an enormous amount of heartburn among big corporations because an enormous number of people are refusing to go back to the crap jobs that the corporations <laughs> offer. That they were them. paid crap for. <laughs> They're being paid crap wages, being treated like crap. They have abusive conditions. They have, you know, shifts that that are practically designed to keep them from having a life because they never know more than a day in advance when they're going to be working, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of these expressions of casual contempt and abuse that are pervasive in corporate culture toward the working classes. And all of a sudden, having had the, 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 the time out of the coronavirus, of the virus panic, okay, all of a sudden, thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people are going, you know, I'd rather live in my car. I would rather live in poverty than go back to that crap. Yeah. And so there are the, – so the, the, the corporate franchises, the fast food places, a lot of these other outfits are scrambling because they can't get anyone to work under the um, sweatshop conditions. Want to hear a, wages. another interesting anecdote on this go ahead. topic? Uh, a few weeks ago, a – ice cream st shop in Pittsburgh couldn't get mm -hmm. applicants. They were offering like seven eighty an hour. <laughs> yeah. They, they raised it to $15 and they got over a thousand applications. Of course. Of because, course. <laughs> this is called hey, supply if I'm gonna scoop and this, demand. <laughs> yes. And it's, it, this is how markets work perfectly. Exactly. Uh, and, but the whole point was that they, this, it was not supposed to be that way, according to the managerial classes. No, no, no. Um, the working classes were to take whatever, whatever crap they were given. They were to accept whatever sweatshop wages, whatever menial conditions, whatever um, degrading treatment the corporate overlords chose to throw at them. And the problem with – I don't think anybody – when the, vir when, the, when the virus panic hit and everything was shut down, I don't think anyone thought that maybe people would use the time to stop and think and say, my, you know, my life sucks. My life really, truly sucks. I am not going to go back to that. I've got to find something else to do. I don't think anybody in the, in the salary class, in their darkest dreams, thought that these people would actually go, okay, 
I have some time. Maybe I should reflect. But that's what happened. And so a lot of evil magic, a lot of attempts to control people's consciousness, to lower their consciousness, to make them just obey and trudge through the routines, a lot of that has collapsed now. And we're going to see what happens. It's going to be very interesting to watch how many corporations are going to say, okay, we're going to raise wages, give people predictable schedules, and maybe even benefits. Ooh, in which medical they health care. <laughs> well, <laughs> they're, going to drive, they're, going to, they're going to have to drive down the price of health care. And the, the thing is that that would be the simplest thing in the world. The only reason that the health care in America is so expensive is that we have a culture of fantastic klept- kleptocratic profiteering. Mm. In healthcare, when you have an ordinary drug that you know that did not cost that much to make, I'm sorry, and they're charging thirty-five thousand dollars a year. <clears throat> Why? Because they can. Because they're sheltered from antitrust re- regulations by you know by government edict. Because you know it's all this this nice little gimmick that funnels money into the hands of the all of those who are already too rich. And so they're going to find they're, – they're already in the process of finding out you can only keep going that way so long. Mm-hmm. The whole Obamacare thing – I mean the point of Obamacare has been missed by a lot of people. Did you notice that the whole push toward um, the mandate happened immediately after there was um, a couple of studies released showing that more Americans were doing office visits with alternative health care providers than with MDs? That That's came amazing. Out. That and doesn't then, shock me for a moment. Exactly. The thing is, that came out. That came out, and within months, all of a sudden, there's got to be the mandate. What they're doing is trying to force people who did not want mainstream health care to pay for it anyway. That was the that was the whole reason behind Obamacare. It wasn't about health care. It was about extracting money. It's about it, you know imposing a government mandate to make people pay whatever the health industry wanted them to pay, and you know it was also one of the major reasons why Donald Trump run in why Donald Trump won in 2016 because he was the only candidate who was saying we're going to stop this. Yep. Uh, and, getting yeah. getting uh, back to that that so when you look at then the, the kind of magic that was used, uh, I want to uh, quote you one more time from your book. Mm-hmm. Uh, you state, every competently trained mage knows that effective magic requires unity of intention. Mm-hmm. Every completely tra- competently trained mage knows that effective magic requires what military personnel like to call OPSEC, for the rest of us, operational security, better known as keeping your mouth shut. Mm-hmm. Every competently trained mage also knows that it is much more effective to build your side up than tear the other side down is mm-hmm. an old editor of mine used to say accentuate the positive yeah there there was that that, that tacky song in the 1930s it had its problem accentuate the positive it was you know a nice little jingle but in magical terms it works if if you were to look at a billboard where there were a bunch of gloomy people holding cans of fizzy brown sugar water and smiling so you could show their tooth decay, you would not be tempted to buy that substance. Not, a little, if, mm-hmm. if exactly, not even a little bit. <laughs> not even a little bit. And so, yeah, one, the, re, the, the passage that you quoted, I was talking about the reason why, um, the, why, why among other things, Hillary, Hillary's campaign flopped so badly. But it's it's much more it's much more broad. On the one hand, um, yeah, you've got to have unity of intent. You've got to know what you're trying to achieve and to have everything aimed for that one thing. If you don't, you're going to diff- diffuse your energy randomly. You're not going to use it intelligently. You're going to flop. Um, operational security, yeah, there is there there are according to Eliphas Levy, who basically started the magical the modern tradition of magic back in um, 1855 um, with his book Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic. He said there, there are basically four magical virtues: to know, to dare, to will, and to be silent. One of my teachers used to say to know, to, know, to dare, to will, to dare, to, to will, the, to be silent. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> shut the <clears throat> up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, on the one hand, if you let everyone know what you're going to do before you do it, then they're going to be able to stop you. 
On the other hand, every creative artist knows, every writer, every painter, every poet, every musician, if you spend all your time talking about what you're going to do, you're never going to get to it because you'll simply diffuse the creative energy that way. Magic is the same way. It's a creative art, just like these others. And so you don't talk about it. You don't let people know. You just take action. You do it quietly. You do it with a minimum fuss. You do not engage in virtue signaling. Now, one of the reasons I was talking oh, about uh, that. John, yes. I've, I've, yeah. uh, that is one of my favorite quotes from your book. And I um, want to share that with my audience. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. Uh, da, 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 where is it? Okay, uh, uh, I'm going to find it here. You're going to find it there. It's it, it, we're ta we'll be talking about virtue signaling, and there's a lot to talk about because virtue signaling is much more important than most people realize. Because if you want to get one of those comfortable positions as a flunky for the status quo, virtue signaling is how you declare your absolute loyalty to the system. You parade around, and, and the, the, more, the more absurd, the better. You're basically, right. show, yeah, you're basically showing that you will not question any order, no matter how stupid it is, because that proves to your prospective employer that they can trust you, that you don't have a mind of your own, that you'll do what you're told. Because what you found? say is, the quote you have, to begin with, one of the main reasons why the magic resistance threw aside the unity of intention. Up, you're talking about the the, the Clinton, the, the the deep state, all that. They threw um, yeah. uh, unity. They threw aside unity of intention, of intention, operational security, and a positive focus to their workings. Is that all these things would have made it much more difficult to engage in virtue signaling. As we have discussed in earlier chapters, virtue signaling is not a casual thing in a society like ours. It's one of the essential ways by which those who hope to become flunkies in the service of the existing order of society try to attract favorable attention. <laughs> yeah, this the, I was specifically talking in that in that bit about the so-called magic resistance, the people who tried to organize a sort of group hexings of Trump after the mm -hmm. election. And it was, they, they, it was really embarrassing because they, they potentially could have accomplished a great deal because there were a lot of them. I mean, they drew, mm -hmm. it was much larger than the groups of, of you know, Chansters and so on who were doing magic on Trump's behalf during the 2016 election. Um, much larger. There was probably an order of magnitude more people involved. A lot more of them had magical training because so many people in the neo-pagan scene, in Wicca, in God right. of Spirituality, are way over on the left. Okay, mm -hmm. and, I and I bumped into several of them. Yes. Oh, I, 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 I was dealing with them constantly. Um, you know, during during my years as the head of a druid organization, I, I was doing the sort of neo-pagan circuit, and I was constantly meeting these people who, who for whom um, being a witch, being a pagan, being a goddess worshiper also meant being um, way out on the extreme left of the Democratic Party. And, you know, and, and, and um, massively virtue signaling in every direction. But they accomplished incredibly little. They didn't cause significant change in consciousness in accordance with will. Um, they, didn't change the, they didn't do anything to change their own consciousness. They just dug themselves deeper into a state of, of continual hatred and stress. And they didn't change anyone else's mind. And when they tried to accomplish something like, like, do you remember when they were trying to, um, oh, come on, the Supreme Court justice. Mm -hmm. um, oh, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kagan. You know, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, I've, I've crashed on his name temporarily. We will all remember it in, in an instant. But um, yeah, when he was running, he, he, he was um, in the running, and this was um, in the first half of Trump's um, of Trump's term when the Senate was still whisker thin on, on the Republican side. Brett Kavanaugh. Yeah, Brett Kavanaugh, thank you. Yes. When, when, when Kavanaugh was, was up, and so one of the, one of the big who, one of the, one of the big panjandrums of the magic resistance proclaimed they were going to do this mass working to prevent Brett Kavanaugh from being uh, confirmed by the Senate. The day they did their, no, it was the day after they did their working, all resistance uh, in, um, among the crucial senators collapsed, and Kavanaugh was instantly confirmed. So obviously they were doing something very wrong. 
And one of the things I talk about in the book is what it was they did wrong, why they, they, they didn't have unity of focus, why they didn't have operational security, why they didn't have a positive, uh, any kind of positive goal. It was all just, let's hate Trump and hope that that makes everything get better. You, had, you talk about Jung and his concept of the shadow self and mm-hmm. projection. Uh-huh. Do you think mm-hmm. that was a lot of it? Oh, it's, it's, it's a massive role. One of the problems that you have to you have to realize that people in the people in the salary classes who have been supporting these policies that have crushed the working class repeatedly under a boot for decades, they don't think of themselves as as you know people who exploit the poor, even though they do. They don't think of themselves as people who abuse the poor, even though if you work retail, you know what it's like to wait on these people. They think of themselves as being kind as being merciful, as being thoughtful, as being, you know, caring. And so it takes an enormous constant effort not to notice the way they abuse their, their social inferiors. And the way they deal with that is, again, the projection of the shadow. Jung talks about the shadow is, is sort of the psychological dumping ground for everything about ourselves we can't stand. And the way most people deal with it is they insist, no, it's not me who's doing those things. It's those awful people over there. Right. Those bad people, they're the ones who are maltreating the poor. They're the ones who are full of hatred. Um, you know, and, it's, and it's all, Jung talks about this in, in great detail, that if, you, that if you look at your own behavior, whatever incenses you, whatever you cannot stand about someone else, it's because you're doing it too, and you can't live with that. And so facing up to the shadow was a very difficult thing. It's a horribly painful thing, and it typically, it, it typically involves having to wrestle with the realization that you are, to some extent, the things that you hate. And the only good thing about it is once you get out the other side, you actually you've freed up a portion of your consciousness. You freed up a portion of your energy. You can do something more interesting with your life. You don't have to remain stuck in a posture of rage and hatred and, mm-hmm. and fear at those awful people over there on whom you are projecting your shadow. Right. In a way, if you would just accept that we're all part of this. You know? We're all part of it. Yeah, exactly. And, if, and that can be especially difficult in a situation like this, where there's a class difference, where you are rewarded by your class for abusing people of a lower class, which is normal, again, in an aristocracy. And again, if you've ever worked retail, you know how this functions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, okay. I've done this. I've, I've been on the receiving end of, you know, the privileged, the, 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 the members of the privileged salary class for whom my sole excuse for existence is to serve as a punching bag for their frustrations and to get done whatever they want done, whether or not they communicate clearly what that is. Mm-hmm. You know, John, uh, we, we I, I'm going to have to kind of, st- there's a few things I'd like to share with the audience about your book. We could talk literally this. I want to have this conversation for a couple more hours. This is a riot. But in your book, you, you talk, it's almost like you're talking about a certain arc of progress uh-huh. uh, with the, and you compare and contrast a kind of a Faustian vision, mm-hmm. a, an Asian vision, a Magian uh, kind of Islamic uh, vision, mm-hmm. uh, a Vedic vision, and mm-hmm. how America might fit into all that and help us kind of gauge where we are in, in mm-hmm. these myths or visions. Mm-hmm. The, all of this has to do with the idea of the shape of time. And that we don't think we, we are so much a part of our of our own cultures, our own current culture's shape of time. That people don't even think of that. Well, of course, time is a straight line zooming off someplace. It's progress, right? Well, maybe it isn't. That's purely a cultural construct. It's mm. it's it's the cultural construct of Europe, ultimately. What what uh, Oswald Spengler called the Faustian culture. Um, other cultures have different shapes of time. You get some cultures where time is a circle. It always mm-hmm. cycles around and around and around, and so it rises and falls and rises and falls. They've got a point. History certainly shows that. Right. Um, there's the might... demographic. Fo- there's uh, the cyclical demographic folks like um, exactly, yeah, Kondratiev, uh, yeah. Neil uh, Strauss, and mm-hmm. Howe. 
Yeah, honest. exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You can sh- you can show historical cycles very readily, and it's very offensive to believers in progress because mm. um, the whole gimmick of progress is no, no, no. The past we've left the past behind, and we're on our way to some kind of you know imaginary Star Trek future. Uh, sorry, but well, we don't have to get into that. <laughs> there are also, I mean, there are, and there are cultures where time is, is stationary. Mm. where nothing actually changes, where time has no direction. You also have cultures where time has a fixed, limited direction. There's the creative, you know, think of, think of the, the sort of traditional Christian or traditional Muslim idea. Time begins at the creation of the world. It continues along this fixed track, you know, hitting specific stops en route. Um, it, reaches the, it reaches the end of the world. The world ends and then time is no more. It's a very weird place if you didn't grow up in it. You made but, me think of like the uh, dark and medieval ages where yeah. things were kind of a steady state. Exactly. And um, a lot of tribal peoples, they have the idea um, that, you know, the right way to do things was handed down at the beginning of time by, the, by a culture hero or the spirits or a god. And nothing has actually changed ever since then. It just goes on. And so you have all these different shapes of time, and the one that our culture is into right now, the linear, in the infinite extent, extension of Faustian time, it, that you know it seems very logical and natural to us. But one of the things that I that I'm pointing out is that again, that's the creation of a specific culture. It is the the only culture in history to use a linear perspective in its art, by the way. So that same linear thing, that that goal to to eradicate distance, to go zooming off to infinity, it's it's a cultural creation. Um, I don't think we really have time to get to the fine details. Yeah, because it, it would like you know what happens when we realize. Uh, what is it? So Caesar wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. Yeah, Alexander, Alexander the Alexander, Great. Okay. Of, course, mm-hmm. of course, he he was wrong, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but that was the that was the point where his linear um, his linear ambition ran dry, and you know there he was staring up at the mountains of the Hindu Kush and going, okay, I guess I've gone as far as I can. <laughs> mm-hmm. And one of the things that we are in the process of finding out in modern industrial cultures, we're staring at, you know, an equivalent, realizing that we've gone as far as we can and attempts to sort of reenact the moon landings Mm -hmm. and um, bluster about going to Mars and this kind of stuff. Come on, come on. We, you know, just as we, people have been building flying cars since 1917 and they don't work because flying cars are a dumb idea. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, they, they are. Any engineer will tell you that what makes a good car makes a lousy plane and vice versa. So a flying car is a bad plane and a bad car at six times the price. Uh, and so... Um, uh, that didn't stop a friend of mine from de- oh, trying to design one. Yeah, I know. No, peop- it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like alchemists in, in late medieval Europe who were convinced that they could figure out how to turn lead into gold and get very rich. Or people who pursue perpetual motion. Or, you know, every culture has its fantasy. Why it should be flying cars in ours, I'm not sure, but that's that's one of the great fantasies stuck sideways in our imagination. Mm. But it's it's that same thing. We what we what we are going to have to do here, especially here in America, is realize that the line doesn't go on forever. Mm. That just as you know, our Western expansion came to a screeching halt at the Pacific Ocean because there was no more continent. That here we are. But the eagles, you know, um, in what was uh, the last resort, you know, um, there is no more new frontier. We have got to make mm-hmm. it here. And that's that realization back in the 70s when they when they originally sang that, that was beginning to dawn on some people. And people have been running from it like terrified rabbits ever since. You're, you know, Fleeing. it's interesting you say because it is like in the 19, early 1970s, we had stabilized uh-huh. the population in the U.S., not through coercion mm-hmm. or anything, but mm-hmm. we had educated women. Yeah. Uh, you had. You know, it was kind of, you had these apocalyptical movies out mm-hmm. there, uh, like Soylent Green and everything. It's uh, like si- Silent Running. Oh, yeah. I uh, love that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it, we were, it seemed we, 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 we started to kind of sit back mm-hmm. on our haunches and say, okay, let's figure out how we might be able to 
you know, look ourselves in the mirror now, but then it seems Reagan came in. Oh, yeah. And it was a new morning in America. Morning in America. Welcome to our 40 year vacation from reality. And, but the thing is that that's, that's understandable. It, you know, we're facing, we're facing as every civilization eventually faces, um, the end of the dream, the point at which the, the fantasies and the dreams and the, and the mythologies that, that basically functioned during our, exp- our period of expansion, those have run out now. They're no longer functional. They don't work anymore. You know, there is no more new frontier. We have got to make it here. We need to settle down, figure out how to stabilize our situation, figure out, figure out how to make a good life for ourselves and mm. how to regain some scraps of the democracy that we used to have, um, despite the efforts of our, our, our aristocrats to claim otherwise. Do you think there'll be a time and maybe that 20% that serve the uber wealthy and powerful kind of get it in their heads? It's like, wow, we we've kind of got the ladder up against the wrong wall and throw their lot in with the masses or um that's one of the things that tends to happen and um it's i don't think we're there yet but it depends it, it i mean it's partly the uber wealthy and it's there there's there's all kinds of power centers in a society but the existing order simply doesn't work at this point it doesn't work for the vast majority of people our country is falling apart and the the a system that is really beneficial for maybe 20% of the of, and 20% getting on 10% at this point mm-hmm. of the population. And, you know, that is not as, as you know, the aristocrats of France found out in the wake of 1789. That's not a strategy with a long shelf life. And it comes to a bad end. And it comes to a bad end, exactly. Um, hope, my hope is that we can avoid doing it the violent way. There are many ways you can do that. There are many ways you can, you can shift gears and reorient and discard a lot of, discard some bad habits, embrace some new habits, um, figure out how we're going to make it here, to borrow the, the term again from the Eagles, mm-hmm. and um, to come up with a new, a new grand design that will allow us to live together in, in more or less at peace with each other. Um, that's what societies do. That's why societies change. And I, I expect we'll see such a change in the decades immediately ahead. Because what we're doing doesn't work. What we're doing is falling apart around us. So, you know, when, when, when the system no longer functions, change is inevitable. Uh, wow. Well, John, on that note... <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to thank you so much for being here today with me. This was great. Uh, again, to the audience, uh, the book is The King in Orange, The Magical and Occult Roots of Political Power. Uh, I think, uh, John, we could have talked for another two hours about this book. And it's not a, it's not a big book. It's, uh, no. I mean, about uh, 190 pages. Yeah, uh, it's, it's not it's not huge. It's just I, I packed a lot of stuff in it. Um, it will take it, it. It takes most people a couple of readings to really you know, to really get out everything that's in it. But it basically it's an attempt to look at what has what happened in the era of Trump through a different light, in a different way, and to see where we can go forward from here. Great. Now, John, where can our viewers find you? Online? Okay. Um, you find me online at ecosophia.net. That is my, my weekly blog. That's E C O S O P H I A dot net. And I am also I also have a Dreamwith journal at um, ecosophia.dreamwith.org. Great. And I you also have a Patreon page? I have I, a, I have I have a Patreon page and a subscribe star page for those who like using subscribe star instead. It's under my name, John Michael Greer. Look me great. up, you'll find me. I, I am a subscriber through Patreon. Mm-hmm. I look forward to getting your emails, which are your blogs. Uh, they're amazingly informative. Uh, Thank you. And uh, it's just, uh, I, I can't recommend those enough to people. So very good. John, again, thanks so much for joining me and to Thank our audience. Yeah. Thank you for having welcome. me on. And audience, thank you for listening. Right on. All right, John, take care. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye.